preaching a message this morning that I just simply titled Molded by God. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to read out of Jeremiah chapter 18. And we're going to read verses 1 through 12. Jeremiah 18 verses 1 through 12. The word which came, which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought, or he worked, a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand... So are you in my hand. O house of Israel, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. <laughs> now therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you, and devise a device against you. Return you now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, There is no hope. But we will all walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. Well, that's an encouraging word right there from the Lord this morning. Amen. So really what we're dealing with here is we're dealing with the nation of Israel. And I, was get, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but they're in a spot in their history, if you will, where they have rebelled against God. Now, we can reconnect Israel to our own lives as Christians, and we can place ourselves in a similar type situation. Every last one of us, in some way, shape, or form, has rebelled against God. We can think of ourselves all holy and self-righteous all we want to, but the reality of it is, is that each and every one of us has gone our own way. We've walked in an opposite direction of what the Lord would have wanted us to do. What the Lord says right here is that Israel really is his people. He says that he says, I'm the one that builds nations and I can also pluck them down. He said, if a person will turn towards me, then I will repent. And what it means to repent literally in the terminology of when God uses the word, it means to change the mind. I know what the word of God says, that God is never changing. He never, he's always the same. He is. God is steadfast. He's never changing. But he's merciful. He's merciful Thank towards you, mankind. He's hopeful that mankind will change his heart and change his mind. And whenever man changes, in that sense, God will also change. God, God says, I will repent from bringing destruction. I will repent. I will change my mind from doing harm to that nation. And instead, I will lift them up. And I will build them up. And, and that's the story that's behind what's going on here in the history of Israel, where they are in this time frame. You know, I was thinking, though, of, of this potter and how he's molding and how he's conforming. And there's a scripture in Romans 8, 29 and 30. And that's what I titled this morning's message, Molded by God. The scripture in, eight, in Romans 8, 29 and 30 says this, For whom he did foreknow... He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You know that word conformed right there in this, in this scripture describes being fashioned uh, likened unto. Like being fashioned like something else. And, 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 and so it made me think of a New Testament scripture that sounded a lot like what was going on in this Old Testament passage. So they're be, we're being fashioned like unto the image of his son, Thank you, Jesus. that he, Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also 
glorified. Now, you know, there's a lot of theology, a lot of truth in this one little passage of Scripture. But instead of getting too deep, I'm just going to try to keep it relatively simple. You know, the idea of predestination, there's a lot of people that have argued about that over the, di- over the years. But what I do want you to know is that it is talking about the fact that God has foreknowledge. God sees in advance. You know, kind of like whenever you ever try to talk to your kids about a certain thing. And try to like impart some wisdom to them. Try to explain, listen to me, I've been down this road. You don't want to go the path that you're going. I remember my dad even tried to talk to me about some things. You know, as, as hardcore as he was. You know, son, if you, you, don't, you want to listen to, you want to listen to counsel. You don't want to just go down the wrong path. You know why? Because parents, unlike children, have already traveled and have some wisdom. That, that doesn't make us like God. But we have seen some things that the child hasn't seen. God sees everything. God knows everything. He knows everything in advance before it ever happened. God knew how he was going to save mankind. He was going to ultimately prepare a nation through whom he would give us Jesus who would die on the cross for our sin and it's in Christ it's in Jesus that all that molding and that conforming and that fashioning can take place he he, he goes on to say this though that whom he called he also justified you know there's a process to the molding that's right it doesn't just happen overnight God sends his word forth. It's the word of God. And that's a big part of my message this morning. The word of God has to go forward. The ear has to hear it and has to respond to the truth of the gospel. When did you first hear the word of God? Amen. I don't know about you, but I can still remember the first time I really heard the word of God. It came from my older sister. Where were you? What were you doing when you first heard the word of God? When the word of God falls upon the ear and the heart is received receptive towards it, then a miracle takes place. When did you get saved? I I venture to say that many times the first time we heard it is not necessarily the first time we responded. Amen? Sometimes we have to hear it a few times before we respond. But can you remember the time that you really, really responded? Because when you did, that's when you got justified. Amen. The word justified literally means to be made innocent in the eyes of God. It means to be made righteous in the eyes of God. It means an exchange took place. Jesus took your guilt. You were given Jesus' righteousness as a gift because that was the plan of God from the beginning that he would give Jesus his righteousness as a gift. And whenever you said yes to Jesus, he took your guilt away. He gave you the gift of Jesus' righteousness. And now the Father sees you and he says, no longer guilty. Hallelujah. That's a good word. And it's important that you get a revelation of that. Let me tell you why. Because the devil will constantly want you to feel guilty. He will constantly want you to feel condemned. Don't misunderstand what this preacher is saying. God ultimately, the the life of the Christian is supposed to line up according to the word of God. Not in your power, not in my power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And at the same time, I got good news for you though. That God, hallelujah, sees you as righteous in Christ if you have received the Lord Jesus as your Savior. The enemy wants to keep you in a state of condemnation and guilt. He wants to keep you in a place where you feel unworthy. That every time you mess up, every time you transgress and you go back to doing something that you're not supposed to do, that you would feel guilty and unworthy. But Jesus' blood has made you worthy. Ultimately, as you're being justified one day, I got good news for you. You're going to be glorified. Hallelujah. The Bible teaches that one day you will be as he is. Amen. You're not going to be a little Jesus. There's only one Jesus, amen? But you're going to be as he is in this sense. He had no sin. He was the one that came upon the earth and he walked without no sin. One day, the sinful nature will be eradicated from your humanity. You're going to have a whole different kind of body. You're going to have a glorified body. (laughs) I can't tell you exactly what it's all about, but I I can tell you that the Bible says that walls couldn't contain Jesus. Next thing you know, they're eating in a a house and Jesus is in there. Uh, You know, I I don't want to get too deep on you, but you know, you think about, I do think about this sometimes. I can't, I'm not much of a scientist, but atoms are in constant motion. And everything that we see, I was trying to talk to this girl the other day that was cutting my hair. And, you know, because she's just so philosophical, so whatever the case. And I'm like, well, I mean, you know, talking about the fact that the chair that I was sitting in was in motion. I mean, she said her daddy taught her physics when she was young. Okay, well, I don't know much about physics, but I do know one thing that somehow, some way they say atoms are in constant motion. 
you know, and you know what that goes along with that? I'm completely off base right here. But, but you know, the word of God says in the book of Hebrews that he upholds all things by the power of his word. Yeah. You know what I was thinking about? I think if Jesus quits speaking, everything spins out of control. Electrons and neutrons, everything goes out of, out of control. Everything falls apart. Jesus holds it all together. I don't know what the glorified body is going to look like, but whatever it is that's in motion, it, you just be able to walk through. But you'll still be able to eat. You'll still be able to drink. Amen. Jesus said to Thomas, he said, stick your fingers in my hands and see not that I am flesh and bone. He didn't say nothing about blood, though, because you know what? The life of the creature is in the blood on this side. I believe with all of my heart that the life of the creature on the other side is going to be the spirit of the living God. Amen. Amen. Right. Either the spirit of God is in you today. Hallelujah. Today is the day of salvation. Don't forget, amen, to, to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I kind of got off track, but I was talking about being conformed, fashioned like Jesus. Amen. The calling uh, to be like him, the, the acceptance and the transformation that takes place on the inside. Amen. And then ultimately one day glorified and looking like him. You know, every child of God, kind of like Israel in their life, as I said this already, gone in a direction that is opposite of God's will for them. And this theme is repeated throughout the scriptures, throughout stories in the Bible. You've heard the story time and again. Amen. If you read the Bible, you'll see whenever God called Abraham, there was a famine in the land. And the Bible says that Abraham, against God's will, God never told him to do it. God, Abraham went back towards Egypt. But not only that, recently we talked about Jacob, right? We talked to whenever I preached on Jacob. What did, do you remember what I told you about Jacob? He deceived his father Isaac. God had a plan for Jacob's life. But Jacob took matters in his own hand, went his own way and deceived his father instead of trusting in, in what God could do and what God would do. <clears throat> if you look at the life of Moses, he took matters into his own hands. He killed an Egyptian and he buried him in the sand. Peter denied Jesus. Thomas doubted Jesus. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that repeatedly throughout the scriptures, we see God's people turning their backs on the Lord, acting in a way, deciding to live their lives in such a way that they're interconnecting themselves and acting more like the world world than what they are really acting the way that God would have them to do. And in this story, that's exactly where Israel is. Israel is, has interconnected herself with the world, the world around her, the world of the people of the other nations around them, because you know what the truth is? I mean, we don't like to hear this, but they wanted to do what the world around them was doing. Yeah. And then, you know what they ended up doing was they ended up worshiping the gods, the false gods of those people around them. Yeah. You know, people are tempted still today in their flesh to go against gods in his way. Israel was tempted to worship these false gods. But, you know, the temptations really aren't there because you probably sit in the audience and you probably think to yourself, well, why in the world would you want to worship a false god? I mean, that's kind of dumb. You know, to worship idols, to worship false gods. But can I tell you how they have, you know, what their church service looked like? And I mean, I'm not trying to be irreverent. I'm really not. I'm just saying the way that they had, the way that they, their religious, their religious activity was, was sexual. They, they, they engaged in sexuality because, because they were worshiping false gods and everything was sensual and it was built upon their flesh and they engaged in these sexual rituals. And the truth of the matter is, is that they were being drawn according to lust. And the same thing happens in our lives today. I'm not saying that it's always sexual, but the word lust in and of itself means to have a desire towards something that you're not really supposed to be desiring. Amen. And so, and it's something that typically will make you feel good. Because if it didn't make you feel good, you wouldn't even want it. And that's where Israel has found herself. She's found herself in this particular situation and ultimately connected with these um, practices. There's demon spirits connected to that. Why do you think that whenever people 
make a decision that they're going to say, you know what, I'll just kind of like open up this little door right here and I'll just casually do this little thing and it's not really that big of a deal. But then the next thing you know, you look backwards on your life and it's been some long period of time, maybe even years, and you don't even understand how in the world did I end up right here? I'm still so far away from where I used to be and you thought that you were just casually opening up a door, but the reality of it is, is that there's demon spirit. Do you, do you believe in the spiritual realm? Do you believe that there's, you know, a lot of times pre, uh, pastors and preachers and churches don't want to talk about this kind of stuff today. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's a spiritual realm that you and I can't see. Oh, once we're in our glorified body, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to see it real good. But the reality of it is, is that today we can't see it. But let me tell you, that's what the strongholds are. Those things that grip a hold of you and try to drive you in a direction that you're not supposed to go, that you don't have the power over. The stronghold. And sometimes it's not things like lust. Sometimes it's not thing, things like that. Sometimes it's a gossiping tongue. Come on, somebody help me out. Sometimes it's a lying tongue. Sometimes it's a self-righteous spirit. You think that there aren't demon spirits behind self-righteousness? The Pharisees and the Sadducees were driven by self-righteousness. And I guarantee you, Jesus says, you're of your father the devil is what he told them. Sometimes self-righteousness is worse than sins of vice. And let me tell you why I say that. Most times, whenever people are living a sinful lifestyle, they know, I mean, and you know what I'm talking about. Most people know that they're going in the wrong direction. Amen. Self-righteous people don't even realize that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Israel was in the middle of a mess. And Israel, like Christians, sometimes was in a bad place of their life. And sometimes it's blatant sinfulness. And sometimes, like I said, it's just the gossiping or the lying tongue. It's callousness or coldness towards the things of God. Things like a bad attitude. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Right? Bad attitudes. We walk around and we talk about our Christianity. Right? I, look, the Lord deals with me about this all the time. So if I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching at me. You know, how many times I got to tell you, I'm just being real. Can we just be real with one another this morning? That it's not always the more obvious things that we deal with, but that God desires to do a work in our hearts. Amen. Amen. All right. And so God always has a specific way of drawing his people back towards him. He uses his word to get their attention. And God will always get his people to a certain place where he can cause them to hear his word. So to make it more like alive and real for you is, is just the various things that we were talking about. Whatever it is that you deal with in your own life. You know, whenever I, whenever I say something that maybe exa wasn't exactly right and I see that little face that maybe she made, the Lord already stimulates my heart and he shows me that I was wrong. There was more than one time that I started to feel convicted about saying certain things in the way that I was handling certain things. That's God trying to cause us to hear his voice and trying to get us to respond. I know that's somewhat of a look. It seems like a little thing, but in reality, it's not. These are the kinds of, th this is just one example. I mean, you know, if we're going to be soft and sensitive enough for the Lord to be able to hear him in, in areas like this, especially if we're over here telling people People that we belong to the Lord, amen, they're watching us and they're, and, they're, and they're paying attention to our behavior and the way that we respond and the things that we do. That was really my first point, though, was a place of hearing. God wants to get us to a place where we can hear. In verse 2 of Jeremiah that we read, the word of God said, God said, I will cause you to hear my words. God told Jeremiah to go to a specific place. And in that place, he would give his word to him. And the truth about God's people is that many times when they're comfortable, they're not desperate to hear God's word. So God has to allow them to get to a place where they will want to hear his word. Amen. And sometimes whenever things are going just fine and everything seems to be going good, then the reality of it is, is that we just become complacent and we don't necessarily really want to hear the, what, what God has to say. Psalm 32 verses 8 and 9 says this. I always love this scripture. At least whenever I read it and the Lord showed me that, that sometimes I'm this way and he was speaking to me. 
The Lord says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. Isn't that beautiful? That's right. That's one of the most beautiful things. And I don't want to get ahead of myself about being a Christian. You have God on your side to lead you and to guide you. Here he is. I will guide you with my eye. We just talked about earlier the fact that God, he, he has foreknowledge. He sees in advance. He knows when there's trouble ahead on the road. He said, I'm going to guide you with my eye. Amen. And he says this, but don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come unto you. In other words, I'm over here desiring to talk to you. I'm desiring to lead you. I want to guide you. I want to speak to you. I can see that there's trouble that lies ahead. But don't be like the horse or the mule, which are stubborn. And unless you put a bit and a bridle in their mouth and pull their head in the direction that you want them to go, they won't come. The Lord wants to be able to reveal his word to us for us to be able to hear his word and that we would be willing to respond. Amen. This passage just shows us the truth that God always desires to lead and guide us. You know, one of the most powerful things I kind of alluded to it, but the truths about being a Christian is that the spirit of God speaks to us. Yeah. You, you know, that's really what makes us different than the world Amen. around us. Amen. I don't know about you, but it's real easy sometimes to look at the world around us. I don't really do it as much anymore, and I'm grateful that I don't. It's easy for us to look at people that aren't saved and for us to look down on them and for us to think in our mind and in our hearts, man, I don't do what they do, you know. Um, but the reality of it is, is that that the real only difference between us and the world is the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. I've tried to make that real clear. I want it to be real clear to us that the only re the, the difference between us and the world is the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in our hearts. <clears throat> When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that tells you that you're a sinner and that you needed a savior and you respond by faith, a miracle takes place. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but listen, part of that miracle is that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. One of the most powerful truths, once again, is that God speaks to us. I want to give you a couple of New Testament scriptures that talks about how God speaks to us. Look what it says in John 14, 16 through 17. <clears throat> it says, this is Jesus talking and he says, I will pray to the father and he will give you another comforter. You know who he's talking about right there when he talks about another comforter? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word in the Greek is a paraclete. The word para means side. Clete means call. To, or to be called. The Holy Spirit is the one that was called to come along our side to help us. He's the help helper. He's our comforter. Amen. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray to the Father and He's going to send you another comforter so that He will abide with you. He's going to live with you forever. <laughs> He's the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Yeah, have you ever talked to anybody before that says, oh, we're all God's children? I know I say this a lot to y'all. We're all God. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. We're all God's creation. But the word of God says that he gave Jesus and he gave the word about Jesus. And to them that were willing to receive, to them he gave the power to be the sons of God. We're not all the children of God. Those that have received Christ through faith become the children of God. That's the difference between us and the world. The world can't receive him because they don't even see him. They don't see him, neither do they know him, but you know him. He was talking to his disciples because the children of God have always been connected or had the Holy Spirit helping them. At the time that he's saying this, his disciples are Israelites. They're, 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 he hasn't gone to the cross yet. Right. But his disciples are are, are Jews. And, and, and the history of the Jews is that the Holy Spirit has always been with them. Right. Am I losing you? Am I getting too deep? Getting too technical? You remember in the Old Testament, he was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That was the Holy Spirit. That was the presence of God. That's the scripture that says, I will guide you. I will lead you. I will show you which way to go. God's always promised that he will lead and guide his people and show them which direction that they should go. Right. Yeah. He says, but look, but you know him for he dwells with you. He's been with you, but he's going to be in you. 
And that's the good news that I wanted to tell you this morning. I know I've already said it, but let me say it again. When you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you put faith in Christ and what he's done, a miracle happens where the old man born of Adam, bound by sin, dies. And a new man is resurrected to newness of life. And now that the sin debt has been paid, the Holy Spirit can come and live on the inside of your heart. And that's what makes you different than the world. The fact that the presence of God lives on the inside of you. It's surely not because you do everything right all the time. It's surely not because you're the most righteous person in your school. It's surely not because, because you don't ever mess up. Because Lord knows each and every one of us has gone astray and done things in a way that the Lord wouldn't have us to do. So we're talking about hearing from God this morning. The reason you can hear from God is because God lives in you. Amen. Look at this scripture right here, 1 John 2, 20. I used to love it. I used to have this, uh, this other preacher that I used to live, that well, I used to go to his church and he would talk about this word all the time. He got an unction, an unction from the Holy One. And I really knew what that meant. But with that word unction right there, it means you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. I've shared this scripture with y'all before, but this word unction literally means charisma. In the Greek, charisma. Kind of like where we get the word charisma. The word means anointing. It's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's how God will speak to you. God speaks through His Word as you read His Word. Amen? He speaks through His Word because His Holy Spirit will stimulate you and you'll be able to feel His presence. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? Amen. Have you gotten saved yet? Does the Holy Spirit live in your heart? Amen. Amen. Even before you got saved, when you heard the Word of God, did something start dealing with you? Did you feel an anointing? That's what the word unction right there means. Charisma means an anointing. The anointing is kind of like whenever in the Old Testament they'd smear the believer with oil. The Holy Spirit, when He gets all over you, it's like you can Feel, feel the hot oil that ran down Aaron's beard in the Old Testament. When you feel the presence of the Lord, He begins to deal with you. He's deep down on the inside of you, and sometimes He'll speak to you. You know, what, I don't mean to get off on this, but I want to just try to describe this to you. This is the best way I know how. Sometimes whenever I'm reading the Word of God, it's like the Lord will emphasize something that I'm reading. That's the Lord speaking through His Word. That's His Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit. Sometimes Sometimes, though, you may experience something like this. Now, this is how it's happened to me. And if anybody, I don't, look, we're a small church. I don't mind you raising your hand and throwing something out there if you, if you, you know. But but sometimes whenever the Lord has spoken to me, like I wasn't even thinking about God at the time. I was just busy doing whatever. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like a thought that didn't really come from my head, but it came from deeper within somewhere, shows up, and I know it's God because I wasn't thinking about anything like that. And, and what I'm trying to say is, is that that is the Spirit of God generating something on the inside of me, speaking. God wants us to be able to hear. He told Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house, and there I'm going to speak to you. I'm going to speak to you a word. God wants to speak. Amen to his people. Amen. One thing that I can promise you for sure is that the Holy Spirit will always <clears throat> want to speak to us about Jesus and the work that he's already done. It says in John 16, 13, that he, the spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. You know, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Ministry of the Holy Spirit is that He would reveal to your heart, to my heart, the work of Jesus. Do you know you need a revelation? Yeah. Like I'm telling you, like I, I tell you, I tried the best I can to get up here to explain things. And I don't know if it's the Lord's will to do it this way or not. But sometimes like whenever I'm looking at people, sometimes I wonder, do people even understand what I'm saying? And so I'll try to back up and I'll try to explain it a little bit in more detail. But you know, one of the things that I realized too, is that no matter how many times I back up, no matter how much I try to dissect it, no matter how much I try to break it down, if the Holy Spirit doesn't open people's eyes and ears and prepare their heart to give them a revelation, you could, that's what we need is a revelation. I mean, before we can ever get a revelation, then we have to have knowledge. You know, I was sitting, I heard he did a great job, that young, that little kid that preached for me. Oh, yeah. He looked like he was about 15, you know? I don't know how old he is. I forgot to ask him, but I ended up taking him to go eat. How old? 18. 
Yeah. And I think he told y'all, but he, he told me while he's eating, I've been preaching since I was 12. Wow, yeah. well, I've been preaching since I was 12, but man, I needed a revelation from the Lord. He said, I still wasn't getting it, you know? And, and I mean, you can tell that kid ain't never done nothing wrong. You know, no, just, you know, we've all done stuff that was wrong, but he seems so innocent. But the, but the point to the whole thing is, is that he, and, and one of the other kids piped in and said, man, I know I've had all this knowledge that I've been taught all of my life. And he said, now that I've been at Bible college, he's like, and I've slowed down. He's like, and all of a sudden it's like, now the Holy Spirit's giving me revelation. It's like, it's not just head knowledge anymore. It's opening up. The Holy Spirit's the only one that can give you a revelation of what Jesus did for you at the cross. Sometimes whenever you start talking about the cross, you start talking about the message of the cross, people are like, oh Lord, oh, yawning and doing all this because they hadn't really received a revelation. I can remember talking to people like all of a sudden, man, when the Lord gave me a revelation of the finished work of Christ, the beauty of that is, is that it's all of a sudden a burden was lifted off of my back. And I was like, hallelujah, everything that I was trying to get accomplished in my own strength, it was like the Lord was just pulling it off. I can remember I've shared this before when I was in Venezuela one time on a job and when I was in the oil field and I was jogging down the road in Venezuela and they had rotten fruit all over the, all over the ground. Now that could be preached in a negative way but what I'm trying to say is is that the, the fruit would just fall off the trees and I can remember that before I gained a revelation of what the Holy Spirit could do in my life because of what Jesus had already done I was trying it was like I was over there trying to pick all the fruit all this I'll get rid of all the sin I don't want to get confused with my analogy trying to put do all the work to get rid of it and then all of a sudden whenever the, the Lord started giving me a revelation it was like it just started falling off it was the work of the Lord is what I'm trying to say. All of the things that you tried to accomplish in your own strength and couldn't get it done, now all of a sudden the Lord was doing the work. That's the difference. Hallelujah. But we got to get to a best. It's a good word. It's a good place. We got to get to the place though where we're willing to do it. And in the text that we're reading, we're talking about the prophet Jeremiah. And the Lord said to him, go down to the potter's house and there I'm going to speak to you. He said he wanted to speak to him, and that was my point number one, a place of hearing. God wants to get us to a place where we can hear, amen, where we'll be able to hear his word. But this is my point number two, a place of seeing. He said in verse four of Jeremiah, he said, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred. It was all marred in the hands of the potter. You know what marred means? It was all dilapidated. It was, I mean, for lack of better vocabulary, it was all jacked up. It was twisted up. It was contorted. It didn't look the way that it was supposed to look. The sight that the prophet saw was disturbing and prepared his ears to hear the clay was marred. Sometimes in order for us to hear, there's got to be something that we see that is kind of disturbing. You see what I'm getting at? When the prophet saw the condition of the clay, God had his attention. Many times God's wanting to get our attention. He's allowing things to take place, situations. I mean, you know, Robert was sharing something this morning about somebody that he's been praying for. God's been trying to get a hold of that particular person's attention. How about you in here this morning? Has God been trying to get a hold of your attention in some way, shape, or form, shaking you, moving upon you to get you to a place where you'd be able to hear? You know, when I see this marred clay, it's a type of the fall of man because we know that God created Adam out of the clay of the earth, right? He created and he formed him and he fashioned him. I don't know about you, but I think about, I think about the potter and he's over there. I got that paddle right there and the wheel spinning and you, you've seen it before and he's fashioning and add a little bit of water, moisten it up and, 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 you know, building it up and all this kind of stuff. And then have you ever seen it before where it just kind of goes askew and it goes in its own direct direction? direction and it just it spins off and you know the next thing you know it's just flopped all over and it looks in a way like it's not like it's not supposed to look well God created Adam and fashioned him out of the clay of the earth and when he created Adam and breathed his life giving breath into Adam the Bible says Adam became a living soul he was created in the image and likeness of God and so we see a type of of the fall of man, but we can also see a picture of ourselves, right? Both as part of Adam's fallen race in our first birth, but not only that, also as kind of like Israel was in a place 
where we're not supposed to be. Contrary to God, walking outside of God's will. Times that we've rebelled against the Lord. The picture that I see is that God is spinning the will and adding water to the clay, fashioning it with his hand, and the clay is rising and taking form. But then suddenly it starts to spin off in a shape and a direction all its own. It's going in a direction that, it, that God never intended it to go. It's not the potter's fault. It's not the will's fault. You know, the will, I remember I wrote a poem a while back and it had something to do with the potter and the clay and like the will was kind of like the earth that we're on. You know what I'm saying? The earth is, the earth is spinning a little bit. I guess you'd say God has it under control, but it's kind of spinning a little bit out of control because of the fact of the fall of man. The Bible says that all creation groans. The word of God says that that even the creation longs for the day when God will make us right. That's why things decay. That's why there's poison. That's why there's calamity. That's why there's things that are messed up. But at the same time, God uses this, this, the disturbed spinning of that will called this earth and the trials and the tribulations that take place for a purpose. He uses that purposefully as part of the molding process. And as long as we're in his hands, I don't want to get a hold of myself, but as long as we're in our hands, he will use all of that in order to help fashion us and bring us to the place where he desires for us to be. You know, I remember we're talking about seeing right now. The first point was hearing, and now we're talking about seeing. And I remember the first one of the times that I was studying the book of Romans chapter 6. I've studied that so many times that I saw a little nugget in there that I had never seen before. <clears throat> that there's a progression to sight, spiritual sight, in the book of Romans. If you look at Romans chapter 6 verse 3, <laughs> where I'm talking about these words, no, but, but, it, but in reality, I want you to know that we're talking about seeing. In Romans chapter 6, see what it says? I'm sorry, in verse 3. In verse 3, it says, know ye not. In verse 3, it says, know ye not. And the word there, many of you already know this, is omneo. And you know what that word means? It means unaware. The idea is, is you're either unaware or you're ignorant. <clears throat> You just didn't know. You know, before, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to go through the whole story again, but sometimes I, I used to get offended whenever people would say the word ignorant. And, you know, the word ignorant because I would just take offense to it. But the word ignorant in and of itself is not really bad. It just means you don't know something. It means you need to be taught. You need to be learned in a, in a specific area. You know, before, before my sister showed up at our house on that day when I was 13 talking about Jesus, I just didn't even know. Well, it's not completely true because I did get exposed to this kid that was like, an, he was like an orphan and was living in this home and he showed up at my school and I was, think I was kind of drawn to him because he was real, he was real big and I can remember some people in school tried to mess with him like and, and like he didn't really he was tough okay and they didn't mess with him anymore and I can remember like I would hey dude what's up man what's your name you know because nobody else knew him nobody really wanted to hang out with him and so he invited me over to his house well the people that he lived with were straight up slap crazy Pentecostal you know what I'm saying and uh, and that was the first exposure that I had to people that would talk about Jesus Jesus freaks and then the next thing you know it wasn't but a year later maybe that my sister got saved and and you know I can just remember that before that though I didn't know anything really about Jesus you understand what I'm getting at I was ignorant about it. I had been in religion <laughs> But I didn't understand the truth that, that when you hear about Jesus and you respond by faith, that a supernatural miracle, amen, can happen in your life. So in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, it's talking about the fact that you didn't know. And what Paul's talking about right there is what I talk to y'all about a lot. He's saying, did you not know that those of us who were baptized in Christ were baptized into his death? We were baptized into his burial, and even as he was raised from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. And so what he was talking about there is this, is that you might not have known this, but this is what happened. On the day that you received Christ as your Lord and Savior, a miracle happened in the spiritual realm where the old man that was born like Adam 
died, was placed in Jesus, died with Jesus, and a new man was resurrected. Did you not know? Or were you just ignorant of this fact? Now, the interesting thing is that he's actually speaking to the church. The truth of the matter is, is that the majority of people in the church are ignorant of this truth right here. They're ignorant of the fact that the old man that was born of Adam. And listen, I can tell you this till I'm blue in the face, but till the Holy Spirit gives you a revelation of it, it doesn't even it doesn't even mean a whole lot. I've had people that are like, oh, man, I know all about that cross stuff, dude. And, you know, oh, I've been listening to this and I've been doing that. But you but no, but you haven't received a revelation because if you had received a revelation, then you would have been jumping with joy knowing with the fact that the Lord had set you free from something that you previously couldn't be free from. Yeah. Hallelujah! So the first thing was that you couldn't see because you were unaware. Now look at verse 6. Romans 6 verse 6. He says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. In verse 6, the idea is, is that you're becoming aware. That, that's what it means. It means becoming aware. It means beginning to understand. A little bit of understanding now. And you know, it's almost like the, the, the shade is lifted up a little bit. A little bit of sunlight comes in. Now you can see some things that you couldn't see before. You know, we ain't got it all figured out. Come on, somebody help the preacher out. He, I sure ain't got it all figured out. But my point is, when you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, now it starts to make a little bit of sense. I might not be able to recite it back to you. I might not be able to write it down. But some, now it's starting to click a little bit. Some things are starting to make sense. Amen. This is the place that I really wanted to bring you. Verse 9. It says this right here. Let's read verse 9. What does it say right there? Verse 9. Let me read it. It says, Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. That word knowing there. See, there's a progression. I brought you here because, look, the... Lord told Jeremiah, he said, get down to the potter's house there. I'm going to let you hear my words. But what he saw was that, he, that there was also a place of seeing because he saw that it was marked. And sometimes there's a truth that we cannot see properly. But if we'll stick with the Lord and we'll trust him, he'll bring us through a progression where our eyes will be able to be opened and we will be able to see the things of God. And in this word right here, the literal word in the Greek if you looked it up, I looked it up, okay? This word is used 627 times, Oida. The majority of the time that it's used in the New Testament out of the 627 times is translated as see or seeing. There's a progression in Romans chapter 6 where at first you're ignorant and you cannot see. But as time goes forward after you've given your heart to the Lord, it starts to allow you to see the things of God in such a way that it's so clear that it's almost like you can see it with the eye. Amen. Whereas you could not see before. So it was a place of hearing. It was a place of seeing. Point number three of this is that the clay was in his hand. He said, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in mine. You know, the clay was marred, but I felt like I needed to say this this morning for somebody. I don't know who it was for. You need to know, I need to know, that even sometimes in our life, things seem to be marred. They seem to be distorted and all out of whack. Good news, good news, you're still in the hand of the potter. Amen? God's got you in his hand. He's holding on to you. Praise God. He doesn't want to let you go. Uh, you know, the word of God says in John chapter 10, verses 28 through 29, Jesus said this, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them to me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of of my father's hand. There's also a scripture that says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. No man can be able to pluck you out of the father's hand. Amen. Death 
demon spirits, fallen angels, nothing is going to be able to separate you from the love of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you're in Christ, when you take your last breath here, you take the first breath there, you're going to be in His presence. But oh, it's sometimes rough on this earth while we're going through it. Lord, help us. You know, there's some pretty horrible things that can happen in this life, but we can rest assured that nothing on the outside, I said that, let me say that again, nothing on the outside can remove us from the love or the hand of God. But I'm going to close with this last thought. And that thought is about our choices. Really and truly, that is point number four. A choice to make. There's a choice to be made. The prophet Jeremiah was told by God, go down to the potter's house. There you will hear my words. The prophet Jeremiah saw the clay in the hand of the potter and the clay was marred. And God began to speak and said that Israel is like that marred clay in my hand. And he goes on to say this at the end. The word was given to God's people. But look at what they said. There is no hope. We will walk after our own devices. There is no hope. We will walk after our own devices. Israel said it's no use. There's no hope. We're going to just continue on. I got I'm here to tell you this morning that's not true. It doesn't have to be that way. Amen. That's not true. There's always hope in God. They just wanted what they wanted more than they were wanting to obey God. I believe this with all my heart. While there's nothing on the outside that can remove us from the hand of God, and this is my this is my my position, and I'm sticking to it. Our unwillingness to make the choice to serve God and instead serve self and the world can ultimately result in our heart being hardened, and ultimately we move away from God. Help us, Lord. God is never going to allow anybody to pluck us out of the hand of the Father. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I could have access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Demons obey. Demons shiver and tremble at the name of Jesus. There's no power on this earth. There's nothing that can pull us away from the presence of the Lord. Yet at the same time, God is asking for our will to line up according to His will and for us to make the right choices according to His will. 